Thank you so much for joining us today. First question, how do you think the session is going so far? You know, each session is a little bit different, um, but they also are all the same in, in many aspects. And I think this one's um, in many aspects, it's the same as every other session, um, but also it's very different as well. The, the I guess the lack of um, activities that are usually associated with, with sessions is, is definitely, um, you know, silencing, it seems like that, you know, the, the get togethers afterwards or during session for luncheons and all that, that's obviously a major departure from the norm. Uh, in some aspects, it's better. In some aspects, it's worse. We don't get, a, you know, as much opportunity to, to work closely with other people. And so that's kind of a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, but overall, I think the session's going, going well. Uh, you know, some people say that we haven't gotten enough done yet. And, you know, you're right, we haven't got it done yet, uh, but until we're until we sign he die, you know, that's when I kind of judge the session as far as what we were able to get accomplished. Um, in the midstream, I, I don't um, I don't ever try to gauge on you know where we're going to end up because for the most part, I think we get it done by the end of by the end of session. You know, a big theme this session obviously has been the the balance of powers between the legislature and the executive branch and there are concerns that if lawmakers can call themselves back into session it will result in a de facto full-time legislature is putting sideboards on that ability by having lawmakers specify topics ahead of time the right approach well i think so um and you know i i kind of reject that argument that by our ability to call ourselves back in will somehow lead us to be a full-time legislature. I think actually that will ensure that we don't become a full-time legislature because right now, nothing prevents us from being a full-time legislature. We can continue in perpetuity and just roll and not to ever sign and die. And frankly, if there's a concern that maybe something's coming up on the, on the short horizon, and we don't have the ability to come back in, uh, I think the risk would be that we just won't sign a die and we'll just wait around. That's going to drive us to be a full-time legislature, in my opinion, uh, much more than our ability to call ourselves back for a day or two in the uh, middle of the summer or the fall uh, to address a, a problem, you know, short term. Uh, and, and I think that's evident by when we've ever had to come back for a special session. It's always been a very short duration. We get our business done and then we leave. So I, I kind of reject that idea that, um, you know, it, it leads towards a permanent or full time legislature. Um, I don't think any of us can afford to be full time legislatures. Um, you know, as citizen legislators, you know, we have jobs we have to do and, you know, we can only afford to be here so long. And so I, I think it will help in the long run uh, to make sure that we are not a full time legislature. Uh, Governor Little has faced a lot of criticism from members of his own party for his response to COVID. So in your view, what should the governor's role be in a public health emergency? Well, I think whether it's a public health emergency or a you know natural disaster, flood, fires, uh, you need somebody who can make immediate, quick decisions. And that you know falls to the executive branch, and that's the governor. Um, as far as the criticisms that um, he may or may not have received, you know, I've I've tried to be really cautious to give anybody criticism, whether it's our governor, uh, whether it's a governor of you know California or the president of the United States for the initial response. You know, those first few months um, was a lot of uncertainty. And, you know, March and April, nobody just really had a good understanding of where we were. So I kind of give everybody a pass on that. Uh, would have I have done things differently? Well, of course, I think everybody would have probably done something different if you're king for the Day, you know, we would all, um, you know, do things differently if, if the decisions fell to us. Uh, but during that initial response, I have no criticisms. Um, you know, I think you're going to see criticism no matter what. Uh, you know, the governor's criticized the legislature for what we did as, in, during the legislative process. Um, you know, when we showed up here, he, you know, he was criticizing us. So you have members of our caucus that had criticized him. Uh, I think those are unfortunate. I don't think it's productive, but I think, um, you know, that's the nature of politics sometime. Can you briefly walk us through House Bill 135, which passed um, your body earlier this week? So House Bill 135 is really, um, we put a lot of work into that. It started off as House Bill 1, House Bill 16, House Bill 98, and now 135. But prior to that, uh, we, spent, we spent a lot of time 
in the off session going over that very issue. And it's been an evolution of where we're at. Uh, I think what we found was a really good balance. Um, it allows the governor or any governor, I, 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 don't, um, I don't like referring to it as um, a restriction to our current governor, um, you know, Governor Little, it is addressed for the governor's office to be addressed in future legislatures, you know, or future uh, emergencies. And so I, 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 I want to be careful that when I talk about the governor, I'm not referring to Governor Little, I'm referring to just that office. Um, but what it does is it allows a governor to be able to respond quickly to a declared, you know, emergency. He can declare those emergencies and um, allows him certain powers and privileges associated with that can change rules that are associated with that. And, uh, but it does put a time limit on how long rules changes happen. And I'm, I'm clarifying rule changes because the legislation also allows for emergency declarations to run in perpetuity. But if there's going to be restrictions on people or if we're gonna change rules, then that has a time limit. And so it's not just a 60 day limit on emergencies and they go away. It is only on changes to the rules or if there's restrictions on individuals that that has a limit. Uh, because after that, we feel as though it's no longer responding to the emergency, it's more of mitigation. You're looking at fires and floods and, and those kind of things. Um, in my research, I've not found one non-COVID related emergency. Again, if I'm not talking about the COVID emergency, um, I've not found one time where laws had to be changed because of a, a declared emergency. I found two times where rules were actually changed and adjusted. And, and frankly, that can happen at any time, regardless of an emergency declaration. Uh, the governor's office has the power to have issued temporary rules at any time, and those run for um, until the end of the next legislative session. So that power is still there, still able to respond to the emergencies. The important parts of that legislation, I think, is it defines that jobs are essential. Um, my job, whether I am you know, picking up trash or I'm a doctor or I sell jewelry is essential because it puts food on my table and for my family. And so that was something that we felt was very important. Um, it doesn't prohibit the governor from being able to respond to an emergency and declaring that you can't go into a, a, an establishment, for example, uh, but it does say that you can't just, you can't just deem entire job classes as non-essential. And so if there's a, a, you know, a mudslide that affects a community, yeah, you can tell people that they can't go into the mudslide area to work. That was one of the concerns that was brought up that we, we somehow prohibited the ability for, for a, you know, to make a, a place off limits. And that was something that we made sure that we're, we tailored that to where it allows the ability to respond to emergency, but you can't just deem certain classifications of job as non-essential. And the second most important thing is it said that you can't change laws. If you want to change a law during an emergency, then you need to have the legislature involved in that process. Um, and that's, you know, strictly just following what the Constitution says there. Um, the executive branch is the enforcer of laws. The legislative branch is the uh, creator of those laws. And that's what we did. We just tried to shore up that distinction. Earlier this session, there was a Senate attempt to kind of thread the needle by ending the emergency declaration, but still trying to get those federal funds that the governor and um, the Department of Health and Welfare say are essential for things like vaccines. And so understanding that your legislation isn't COVID specific, do you think that this attempt does a better job of threading the needle between federal funds and getting rid of some of those restrictions that the legislature has been so concerned about? I think so. I think we've, I think we've addressed that really well in this piece of legislation. I, I would point out that, that currently, my understanding, there are no restrictions from the governor's office as far as his, uh, his you know, stage three, it's all recommendations at this point. So this legislation doesn't necessarily address that because the governor has has no restrictions anymore. They are they are only recommendations. Um, so that part of it, I would say that. And the second thing is that was our concern that if we tried to end the declaration and then return it back on, that that could cause some hiccups with regards to you know FEMA support through vaccinations or, or National Guard reimbursements. And so this legislation doesn't terminate them. 
it only terminates any restrictions that are not necessary for the ability to receive those federal funds, resources, and benefits. And so it, it allows them to continue on as long as it complies with the, you know, that section of code. You know, you can't, you can't restrict people's, you know, constitutional rights. And then um, it allows those to continue on so that we don't have a problem with the federal funding. Now, back to uh, non-emergency related issues of the session. What are your budget priorities this year? I think number one budget priority is always education, um, at least for me. I think that is evident by the legislature that the you know, vast majority of our funding does go to education. So that's always a priority. I think there's, a, in fact, there was a good piece of legislation that I'm very supportive of that was introduced this week and, and House Health and Welfare that provides some additional funding for families to be able to respond to the specific needs of their kids during this, uh, I guess, change in how education has happened over the last year. Nobody feels that worse than me. Um, I've still got four kids at home, special needs kids that are in middle school and high school, and trying to, you know, take the place of their teachers is is near impossible for, uh, you know, my wife and I. And so, you know, we've got to find a better way or an alternative way of providing this education, especially during a crisis like this, um, but even going forward. And uh, I'm really excited about that legislation. I, I wish I had the bill number for you. I can't remember it offhand because it just got a number. But, um, but I think it's a really exciting piece of legislation, uh, provides more money into education. So another, another um, you know, chunk of money that goes there that uh, helps support it. So that's number one priority, obviously. Uh, second priority, I think, is, is got to be in transportation uh, infrastructure. We, we have a lot of extra money this year. Uh, and it's usually just one-time money that came from the Federal CARES Act or other responses and, and some because of our increases in, in sales tax uh, revenue collections. Uh, but we have a lot of money there. I think transportation is where we need to spend a lot of that. And then I think my third priority or another priority would be in property tax relief and income tax relief. You know, when you end up with over $600 million surplus right now, uh, we should find a way of returning some of that back to the people who paid it. Now, let's talk about that. Can you walk me through the majority party leadership's tax cut proposal? So there uh, was one introduced recently, and, and I'm, I'm going to leave out a lot of the details, but the basics of it was that it was going to reduce the income tax bracket down to 6.5, and it was going to reduce sales tax on all items down to 5.3. So from 6% from down to 5.3. Um, and that was about a $280 million tax relief package to the citizens of Idaho. Um, I think it's a great package. I don't know if that's the package that will end up across the finish line when we're all done. I, I think there's going to be another bill that will be introduced next week that had more of the governor's recommendations with that one, I, I believe. Um, don't hold me to that though. I'm not the chairman of, of that committee and I'm not even on that committee, but that was my understanding that there will be another package that will be kind of introduced. And so we, you'll see a few of these packages introduced and we will ultimately land on, on something. Uh, I think it would be a failure of this, legisla this legislative session if we didn't provide some kind of tax relief to our citizens, um, but I'm, I'm confident that we will do something. Some House Republicans want to see the grocery tax entirely eliminated. If that hits the House floor, would you support it? I will support any tax relief package that hits the floor. Um, I don't think that's the best response, actually. Um, but, you know, would I support it? Absolutely. Um, if we raise the grocery tax credit, would I support that? Absolutely. Um, I actually think that's a better approach. Um, than just removing it altogether. The research clearly shows that for the elderly and for families that have um, three, four, and more kids, that by eliminating that grocery tax credit and taking the tax off of groceries, that will be a tax increase to those segments of the population. So you will see that that will negatively affect you know the elderly and larger families. And so I'm I'm not overly excited about that particular approach, but if we could do a removal of the tax on groceries and you know include some other relief for those other uh, 
demographics of society, I guess, then I would be supportive of it. But I think there's a better path forward. Over the past few months, we've seen heated protests at government buildings in Idaho and in some cases, individuals, private homes. Should the legislature have more of a role in toning down the rhetoric or, or turning down the temperature, setting that tone for public discourse? I think elected officials do have a role in that process as far as when we, we incite inflammatory you know, language. Um, and I can, I can port, point, point to you know, national leaders that, that have been guilty of that. Uh, it seems like you know, President Trump received most of the attention for that, but I can, I can show many, many examples on the other side of the, the line of party that you know, had equally inflammatory rhetoric um, my, my opinion on, on that is, you know, we need to be more united in our, our discourse, not just between parties, but within our parties and how we treat everybody. Um, I think for the most part, everybody wants the best, they, what they think is the best for the country and for the state. Um, sometimes we differ on what we think the best is, but I think when we use the mindset that you know, whether it's it's uh, my good friend, Matt Erpelding, um, who used to be in the house, I um, miss him dearly in the house, actually. I wish he was still here. Um, but, but you know, he I know he had the best of intentions for what was good for Idaho. I had a different vision of what was good for Idaho, um, but that didn't mean that his vision was, was uh, you know, I had to demonize him as an individual for his thoughts. Um, we could work together and I, and I wish that we as a political society, you know, not just in Idaho, but in the, in the entire United States would, would try to come to better and realize that most people have the best of intentions. Now, we, we obviously differ on where we think that we should end up um, as far as our ultimate goal. And that's okay. That's good and that's healthy. Um, so I would, I would hope that we would be a little bit, you know, kinder, a little bit uh, more patient and understanding that, that people I think just want the best. Um, and, you know, as far as the citizens, protests, I, I absolutely encourage them uh, to do so. That's, that's one of the first, uh, first amendments there in our constitution, talks about the right to, to you know, assemble uh, for redress with your government. And that's important. We need to hear that. When the citizens are upset enough about something, you know, that's one of their rights and, and they need to do that. When they cross the line of making it violent, then that's obviously, um, you know, that's a problem for me. Um, so peaceful, peaceful, just, you know, demonstrations and protests, I absolutely encourage. And um, in, fa in fact, I like it. I think it's healthy. Do you think those protests should be occurring at individuals' homes? I would hope that people wouldn't do that. I think that's um, inappropriate. I think it's uh, disrespectful, not to, not only to that individual, but also to the neighbors. And you have to realize that whether the politician has kids, the neighbors will have kids. That's just completely out of line um, in my world. I, I don't think you should do it. However, I don't think necessarily that we as a government should prohibit that either. Um, you know, there is public space and, you know, on a, a you know, roads or, or sidewalks, as long as it's not on my personal property, people should be free to be able to do that. Um, so it's, a, I think it's a fine line that we've got to make sure that we we address and if our current laws are not sufficient for trespassing and for disturbing the peace, then that's what we should look at, I think, in my opinion. Um, but I, I hesitate to, you know, say blanket, you can't protest out in front of my house. Um, I don't know how that works, you know, in a downtown scenario, if I'm staying in a in an apartment complex right next to the Capitol and, and you know, what, where's the line on that? Obviously, it's different for you know, somebody living in the rural communities versus in an urban environment. But I think we have to be very careful when we start in looking at any infringements on our, um, you know, First Amendment rights. Last question. As of today, multiple staffers and two senators have tested positive for COVID during the session that we know of. Are you comfortable with the legislature's COVID mitigation efforts? Absolutely. I think we've done a fantastic job of that. My understanding is none of that has been community spread here as a result of the actions um, here within the Capitol. Um, you know, people will be able to bring those, those, you know, 
sicknesses, whether it's COVID or anything else, to the Capitol. Um, and, and those are going to happen no matter what we do here at the Capitol. We will continue to find those situations. Um, and I think, I think there's a good amount of precaution that we've taken in those individuals here within the legislature that you know want to be more socially distanced, um, have that opportunity, and and I am, uh, you know, whenever we're, we're working with people, I know certain committees have, have gone to great lengths to make sure that you know our spacing is is our part. We've got that distancing, uh, Zoom abilities for the public to be able to to testify on those and participate. So I think we're doing a pretty good job. Um, you know, whenever you stick, you know, four or 500 people within a building, uh, you're going to see, you know, illnesses passed, whether it's the cold or it's COVID or the flu, you know, those, those things will happen. I think we've done a really good job this year. In fact, I think less of us have been sick, just the normal, you know, colds and flus this year, uh, simply because everybody is being a little bit more cautious, washing our hands a little bit more, you know, staying staying uh, more distanced and and such. So I think that's another you know silver lining to um, you know the response that we're doing. All right, Representative Jason Monks, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate you having me.